I'm Steve Ballard, and this is Inside ECU. We are now in our second century. We employ 6,000 people and train almost 28,000 students. Our mission is to be a national model of public service and regional transformation. We have a responsibility for giving back to the public that supports us by educating tomorrow's leaders, curing diseases, and helping neighborhoods, communities, and our state. This program gives you an in-depth look at our work and the successes we experience every day. We hope you enjoy this episode of Inside ECU. Welcome to Inside ECU. You know, for most of us, the heart takes center stage at certain parts of the year, such as Valentine's Day or American Heart Month. However, at East Carolina University, it's under the spotlight 365 days a year. In this episode, we're going to look at the Human Performance Lab and the College of Health and Human Performance and how they've helped thousands of people over the last 30 years create health and exercise plans to avoid things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity in adults. But now they're looking at it for children. Plus, they're collaborating with the Heart Institute on groundbreaking procedures and patient recovery plans. Imagine a patient having extensive heart surgery and then walking on a treadmill six weeks later. Well, it's happening here at ECU. Plus, would you ever expect the head of the Heart Institute to say he wants a hospital without patients? Well, that's exactly what Dr. Randolph Chitwood said. Why? Stay tuned to find out. But first, ECU students have heart and soul, but it's a different kind of soul than you might think. Well, the thing with heart disease prevention is that it's never too early, but it's also never too late to start taking action steps to prevent heart disease and reducing your risk. ECU students, faculty, and staff took steps literally to raise awareness about heart disease. The event was called the Heart and Soul Walk, headed up by Campus Recreation and Wellness and Greek Life students. But it was more than a walk for a good cause. Each student donated a pair of new athletic shoes that will go to serve those in need. So we involve students uh, for several purposes. Again, to just help create the awareness, but also to get them involved with community service by um, adding the shoe donations that will be given to school children in Eastern North Carolina. That will also promote physical activity because we know that's one risk factor, physical inactivity, that contributes to heart disease. So we wanted to be able to to provide them with new sh athletic shoes uh, to be able to be active. Promoting activity and exercise is also the focus here at the Human Performance Lab. You know, it wasn't very long ago that terms like heart disease, diabetes, and obesity meant you were talking about people probably 40 or older. Not anymore. Come on inside the Fit Building and see the amazing things going on at the HPL. We really try and educate people about the safe way to begin an exercise program so that hopefully that leads to successes that then build on developing a good routine and a good habit. Prevention and research highlight the efforts taking place in the Human Performance Lab. It's no secret heart disease is the number one killer in our country, but many people don't realize there are other factors that can ultimately lead to heart disease down the road. In addition to diabetes, cardiovascular disease is, uh, is very high in its incidence in obese insulin resistant people. And so uh, we try to ad address uh, several uh, disease states uh, in, by trying to combat the progression of, of obesity and, and insulin resistance. The people we're primarily trying to target are the people who do not yet have disease but have a lot of the risk factors for it. So maybe high cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, sedentary lifestyle, which we know is one of the risk factors. So we help identify all those risk factors in our program and give them kind of an overview of where they stand for their risk of disease. Some of those risk factors mentioned, obesity, in particular around the body's midsection, high levels of bad cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, as well as insulin resistance, they contribute to what is called metabolic syndrome. The combination of these medical risk factors, known as the metabolic syndrome, increases the possibility of developing cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Did you know more than 50 million Americans, or approximately one in five, have metabolic syndrome? We find that the biggest um, thing that overlaps when we look across all those diseases is lack of activity with people that are on their way to developing disease and obesity. So carrying around extra body fat and being sedentary are the two biggest risk factors for developing disease. And so whether it's diabetes that they're on their way to developing or possibly that along with heart disease, we're trying to help them um, you know, delay their chances of, of any of those diseases. 
In addition to delaying the chances of developing heart disease, HPL faculty are also trying to investigate why certain demographics seem to be at higher risk. For instance, Dr. Courtright and his colleagues have published findings that show African-American women appear to be more prone to obesity and diabetes than Caucasian women. Uh, it seems to be worse in this particular group. They have a larger propensity to gain weight and to develop the clustering of the disease, these diseases known as the metabolic syndrome. So the National Institutes of Health has uh, granted, uh, granted us the, uh, the financial means to pursue the mechanisms as to why this is occurring and then how we're going to be able to treat it. But there is good news. With exercise, they can revert right back to what a lean individual is able to do as far as being able to process and utilize fat. So that's very encouraging and allows us to make strong statements uh, to, uh, to the parents uh, who, who would uh, now listen and let that trickle down into their families and the children so that we can create a new generation of more active individuals. That's right, he said children. Of course, people think children are automatically and naturally active on their own and left to their own devices, they'll, they'll be healthy. But that's not necessarily the case, as we've seen in the past 15 years. The rates of overweight has increased threefold, and the rates of also diabetes, type 2 diabetes that used to be in adults is now seen prevalently in children. McCartney says the nature of our society has contributed to this increase in disease and risk factors in our population. It's the lifestyle that we're becoming accustomed to, um, the types of foods we're consuming, our children are consuming, um, the lack of activity we get on a daily basis. Everything is very convenient, um, requires the least amount of activity. We know with age that your status as far as health and your strength goes down 10% each decade at least. So you have that problem of if you start at a lower level with your physical strength or your health, then you starting at a lower baseline and you'll decay even further. So it's important when you're a child to get to the highest point you can once that aging occurs after even 20 years of age you start to see some decrements of age. So the goal is to identify and reduce the risks for heart disease. Here at the HPL faculty, staff and students are working with community members, firefighters and police officers to evaluate their current health situation through what is called the cardiovascular risk assessment program. Mr. Stansberry? Yes. We are ready for your stress test. But wait, I'm, I'm, I'm not at risk for heart disease. We'll see. Alrighty, you ready? In three, two, one, and you are off. This is stage one. So EKG is the first thing. The second thing is heart rate. So what we should see is that your heart rate will slowly come up in response to the exercise. So you started at 72, right now it's at 114 beats per minute, which is a normal response. And the third thing is blood pressure. A lot of people say it runs in the family, but there is something else that's worth considering. That is whether or not their family history of disease is truly family history or is it the lifestyle of their family. So if you have a mother or father who is obese, smokes, is inactive, um, the fact that they have diabetes or heart disease may be because of their lifestyle, not so much of your genetics. McCartney suggests remaining at the ideal body weight for your age is optimal. And of course, consult a physician regularly as you get older, especially if you have family history of heart disease. You're doing a great job. Keep pushing up that hill. Really great job. Heart rate's 171, creeping up to that 183. You're doing great. Awesome job. I know it's hurting. Doing good. Coming down. All right, you done? All right. Yeah. Here you go. I'm going to have you walk five minutes on that treadmill. Your speed's going to be two miles an hour. I don't want that heart rate to come down too fast, okay? From the treadmill to the DEXA machine, where they assess my body composition and bone mineral density. The other thing that's really nice about the DEXA scan is it gives you an idea of where your body fat is distributed. Um, it can tell us if you're carrying it more in the midsection, again, increased risk of disease, we know with that type of um, distribution of body fat. So one of the things we try and talk to people about is how to prioritize exercise and schedule it just like they would meetings mm -hmm. or time with their kids. So it's time to face the music. How am I looking for the next five years? The risk is really pretty low, so 2% for heart disease. 
uh, less than 1% for stroke and diabetes. And for congestive heart failure, we don't actually have a score until you get above the age of 40. Well, that wasn't too bad, although she did say 74% of men my age are a little bit better off at not getting heart disease in the next five years. But she did say if I reduce some weight, if I eat better and get some exercise, those risks will begin to go away. Also here at the HPL, researchers are working with folks that are past the prevention stage and are already dealing with cardiovascular disease. And for that, we come over here to the medical campus and the brand new Heart Institute. This facility has been the dream of Dr. Randolph Chitwood and is now a reality here at ECU. It's open and serving the people of Eastern North Carolina, which by the way, have one of the highest occurrences of heart disease in the country. In fact, if we were a state, these 29 counties, we would be 51st. We would be on the highest level of cardiovascular disease and the highest level of death and morbidity. So there's really a mandate, not only from it's the right thing to do, but to return people to their families. The new East Carolina Heart Institute is prepared to fundamentally change the way cardiovascular disease is perceived and treated. And Dr. Randolph Chitwood, director of ECHI, says it's not one person that will make this facility a success. It's a total collaborative effort. The Heart Institute's the concept of cardiovascular specialists, not just doctors, but nurses, technicians, uh, all types of caregivers in cardiovascular diseases, is bringing them all together. We formed a Department of Cardiovascular Sciences taking cardiology and cardiovascular surgery and putting them together. And the collaboration is producing unbelievable results. Dr. Chitwood pioneered robotic heart surgery nearly a decade ago, and now leading hospitals in the country are coming to East Carolina to learn how to perform minimally invasive surgery. The ability to work inside the heart with tiny incisions more efficiently than we can do with our hands. And it's come to the point where it is developed in mitral valve surgery. We've done over 450 mitral valve repairs from worldwide and as a proof of concept. Now the Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai in New York, uh, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, other places are doing these types of operations and they trained right here in Eastern North Carolina in our facility for robotic training run by Dr. Nifong. Did you know the mitral valve along with the aortic valve are a part of the left heart and control the flow of oxygen rich blood from the lungs to the body. If the mitral valve does not open or close properly, it can lead to an increased workload on the heart and various serious health conditions. If left untreated, they can lead to debilitating symptoms, including cardiac arrhythmia, congestive heart failure, and irreversible heart damage. However, at ECHI, patients are not only getting state-of-the-art care, but are recovering faster. We're testing these patients at about six weeks post-operatively, which... For heart surgery. For heart surgery, this is, this is a, these are patients that have had, for the most part, have had mitral valve replacement surgeries, and six weeks later, they look great. When we see them six weeks later, they look great, and they do great on their stress test. So to have thought even 10 years ago that stress testing a patient six weeks postoperatively following mitral valve replacement surgery, that they would have any, they would even be able to get on the treadmill and do any kind of activity, um, it wouldn't have been possible. Dr. Eric Lair is a teaching fellow at ECHI. He came to ECU to learn about robotic cardiac surgery and says the procedure has come a long way from the days where heart patients had an incision running pretty much the full length of their chest. With the robot, we've been able to make much smaller incisions. Uh, we now make an incision four centimeters long just on the right side of the chest and then make a few additional incisions for the robot arms. And the robot allows us to perform this mitral valve surgery safely through a very small incision. And the patients really appreciate it because they get back to work sooner <laughs> instead of being off for you know three months. Dr. Tim Gavin from the Human Performance Lab works closely with cardiac surgeons and says having interdisciplinary collaboration benefits everyone. Well I think that's one of the strengths that we have here at ECU is that we get clinical faculty working with basic science faculty and we bring our st various strengths to the forefront. So what's next? What's on the horizon for robotic cardiac surgery? Dr. Lair says patients may not have any incisions at all other than those needed for the robotic arms. As for Dr. Chitwood, he's already looking into the future and has big plans. We hope to roll this out to, in time, looking at risk factor management. What you'd like to do is be so successful 
that nobody ever comes into the clinics because you've prevented this disease. Yet today, this is the place to come and our clinics are full because we've not conquered this disease. From the students, faculty, and physicians here at East Carolina University, combating cardiovascular disease is a year-round effort. We thank you for joining us for this episode of Inside ECU.